So Reverend Edwin Arison, we are so delighted to be welcoming you here to Fort Wayne uh, for our Indiana Center for Middle East Peace 2022 Gala uh, and to present you with our uh, Champion of Justice Award. Edwin, welcome. Thank you so much and thank you for the warm welcome I've received here from all of you. Uh, it's just been wonderful. Thank you. So Edwin, you're the development manager of the Desmond and Leah Tutu Legacy Foundation. Talk to us a little bit about uh, what that means, uh, Archbishop Tutu's legacy, uh, what that means to you, why you think it's, it's not only his religious leadership uh, in the anti-apartheid struggle, but his person, his personality, his, his being, why they've both captured the world's imagination. Yeah, thank you for that question. It's a, it's, it's a very important question because for the arch, he's, he's public persona and his public pronouncements and his personal integrity and what he does in his personal life uh, comes together with him. He has always strived to bring it together into, into one person. Uh, and I've seen it, of course, many times. I've seen how he would get up after a meal at a family's house, a parishioner's house, and he would actually go and start to wash the dishes or he would walk through the streets of Cape Town and he would see some paper lying there or plastic and he would pick it up, even, even close to 90 years old, he would stop and he would pick up the piece of paper. Uh, he would say, we must keep this place clean, you know. Um, so, so I think for me, um, noticing this with him, within him over the years has been a special um, example to watch um, because I think ultimately we, as, as activists, we must, we must bring this, these two things together. Tell us uh, a little bit about the work of the foundation. The Desmond and Leia Tutu uh, Legacy Foundation, um, of course, the arch only passed away at the end of last year, and so, it's, so it's, it's almost, in a sense, a new time for us where we have to think about how to how to curate, how to hold his legacy um, with him not being there uh, in person. And so one of the most amazing things that have happened in Cape Town is that we have, we have launched a, a, an exhibition on his life. It's called Truth to Power. And it's, uh, it's a world-class exhibition with six different themes. At, at each theme, there's a video of maybe 10 minutes that people can watch. Uh, about his life and and at the moment we've seen groups of school children coming through we've seen groups of uh, church groups coming through international groups coming through uh, so every single day people are coming through our building and and viewing this exhibition and some groups of course they would spend some time reflecting with us on what they've just um, seen and each of the themes are very carefully chosen uh, so there's a theme on education, for example, because he, he was a school teacher. There's a theme that I, I personally like very much. It's, it's called the struggle in the church. And not just the church's struggle against apartheid, but the struggle in the church, because there is a struggle going on in the churches. Um, there's, there's one particular theme called the unfinished business of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, and that, that particular theme... I've seen people walking out there with tears in their eyes, just, just knowing the kind of work that the arch had to do and how he had to carry the pain of the nation uh, when he did that work um, himself. Um, and also seeing this, we have a wall with maybe 20,000 names on it, uh, just, just standing in front of that wall. Um, uh, and I've particularly seen uh, maybe 30-year-olds, those who were not involved in the struggle against apartheid, um, but who and who were born in you know in the democracy, uh, they have found this particularly uh, well on the one hand very helpful, but also on the, on the other hand very painful because they have to try to make sense of what happened during apartheid, but also now how to build the, the new society now. So so the work of the foundation is really to try to use the the rich legacy of the arch uh, for action, for action with young people, with children, um, to build new leaders. That's, that's the main work of the foundation today. 
What would you say is his most important theological legacy? The most important one would be on humanity, on, on the word called Ubuntu. And, and that word means that uh, every person's humanity must be respected. Every person's humanity must be acknowledged. Um, and so the word Ubuntu means, uh, I am because you are. Uh, I, I, can, I can do nothing without you. We are interdependent, <clears throat> pardon me. And, and that's, that's precisely um, to move away from the idea of individualism um, and, to, and to ensure that, that people do things together um, and that people work together for the common good. Um, and that's, that's the strength, I think, of, of his theology of Ubuntu. You know, I've, when I used to teach uh, a religion and conflict class, I talked about Ubuntu, and it struck me that uh, um, it's not just about how one individual relates to another, I am because you, but there's, there's kind of an economic and political sense to Ubuntu, I mean, uh, on, on, a, on a, what, a societal, communal basis, you know, I mean, capitalism it's not Ubuntu, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, so uh, you want to say a word about that? Yes, I mean, even today with the, um, the struggle for climate justice um, and, and the whole, all the issues around climate change, we talk about a new Ubuntu, and it's, it's about the interdependence of all of us, of the whole cycle of creation, um, you know, the, our, our interdependence and how we cannot be or do anything without each other. Um, and if we try to do that, then we will destroy each other and we will destroy the planet and so on. So you're right. It's not just a, a personal, individual kind of relationship issue between people. It's about a common humanity. Um, and then the common humanity then connects with the common home, uh, the oikos. Um, and that's how... Uh, that's how we, we are beginning to really understand uh, the comprehensiveness of Ubuntu. In our, in our country, Martin Luther King Jr.'s beloved community. Mm, mm. The beloved no. The world house. You used Oikos. King called it the world house. Yes, yes. That's, that's precisely. And, and the arch, on a daily basis, he would be um, building that simply by celebrating the Eucharist on a daily basis, creating community and communion on a daily basis. Um, and, it's, and he did this for more than 60 years, you know, as a, as a young priest he started. And for 60 years he did this every single day. And so it's the consistency of, of what he did that's also important, you know, that he was able to build this, let's call it the community muscle almost. Um, and, and, you know, he would say that every human being is unique. Uh, he would particularly seek out the poorest of the poor. Uh, in one particular example, he visited a parish and he said to the priest, take me to the person who is furthest from the, the, the parish church and take me to the person who is poorest in the parish. And he actually went to visit there. And uh, the person who told me the story he said the art stood with his feet in the fireplace and he, and, and, and he related to this person here. He's the archbishop and he is the poorest congregation member, but he related to her as an equal. And, and, and this, this person was saying to me, he could see how the arts could relate to kings and queens and presidents and to the most ordinary person on the ground. And of course for him, there, there were no ordinary people. You would say every person is extraordinary. Every person is a VSP, a very special person. That was, that was what he would keep on reminding us. You and I discussed a little bit about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa. I mean, it really was an extraordinary and courageous effort to bring healing and healing and, and forge a new uh, way forward for a, a troubled nation in the aftermath of a colonial and racist regime. And yet, uh, 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 you know, racism is still a festering wound in our own country. Uh, 
yeah. uh, here in America inflamed by one of our major political parties. You talked about at the foundation the unfinished business of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So uh, what are the lessons for the rest of us around the world uh, uh, that you can share? Yeah, the most important lesson is that we should never leave this kind of work uh, only to the state or only to the institutions. Uh, we should ensure that as, as members of civil society, as citizens of the country, um, that we, we keep this work going because it is, it's an ongoing work. It's a work that probably will never stop because human beings are human beings and human beings need to be reconciled, need to forgive each other every day. Um, so so in, 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 in the case of South Africa, what happened was that the state took full control of the whole process. They had the Archbishop, of course, chairing it and so on, um, but they had the final say. And so the recommendations from the TRC was handed to the president. And Nelson Mandela uh, specifically chose only to have one term as president. And so the next person who became the president had to implement what was in the, in the TRC recommendations. And unfortunately, they did not implement what was in there. And um, for us, that's, that's something of an original sin nowadays for our democracy, because if you don't implement what, uh, what is required of you to implement, especially in terms of law, it means you begin to break down the rule of law. So people who, for example, uh, who were supposed to be prosecuted, who, who did not receive amnesty, well, there was a legal process that that was supposed to happen. The National Prosecuting Authority had to, had to create the case, take it to the courts. The courts had to look at it. And then if there was a case, the courts would have to deal with it. And it, it didn't happen. And so people today ask now, you know, where did the rule of law break down in South Africa and so on? And, and we can simply point to that moment and say, if you were consistent, if you started because we had a new constitution, and if you simply follow the, the precepts of the constitution, then we would have been very far uh, with this. But for political and other reasons, they did not do this, and therefore the whole process actually, in a sense, collapsed, uh, because even though there were a little bit of reparations done and so on, on the whole, the, the process that was, that was there was not followed, uh, and that is problematic. I'm going to ask you two questions in one here, <clears throat> but uh, uh, let's keep both answers separate. The first question is about the 1985 Cairo South Africa document. It was a seminal document following the Barman Declaration, right? Uh, critiquing state theology and church theology, promoting a prophetic theology yeah. that challenged apartheid. And be it became really a rallying cry uh, for churches around the world uh, to stand in solidarity with the black churches in South Africa. So I want you to say a word strictly about the South Cairo South Africa document, Edwin. The second question that I'm going to follow up with is, then how, uh, I want you to talk about how Cairo South Africa became a, a uh, uh, what a, a model in some ways for Cairo's Palestine. But talk to us about Cairo South Africa. Yes, Cairo, South Africa, uh, first of all, it's a, it's a, it, it was a document, but it wasn't meant to be a document to begin with. It was meant to be a process, a process of theological reflection, uh, people's theology, we called it, uh, contextual theology even. Um, it, and, and so what happened was that uh, people who were church people or Christians, uh, but also involved in the struggle, started reflecting on this question, which is a vexing question actually, is how can a so-called Christian government be killing Christian children on the streets? We, we, we could not make sense of this. And so we, we raised those kind of questions, but, but we had moved beyond quite a few other things. Remember in 1982, um, Alan Busak became the president of the World Alliance of Reformed Churches. That's right. And at that uh, particular uh, conference in, in Ottawa, Canada, uh, apartheid was declared a heresy, a theological heresy. 
Um, and so, in a sense, we had moved beyond that by 1985. Um, and, and it was beyond just saying that um, the Afrikaans churches or the state is the problem. Uh, we, we moved beyond that. The second issue was, why is it that Christians want to be neutral about everything? Uh, and, and that's why there was a critique then of church theology as well. And so the first part of the document, um, if one had to simplify it, was really about the state and the Afrikaans churches and how the, they cooperated. Uh, but we had to move beyond that to say, but here's the English-speaking churches, mainly the colonial English-speaking churches, um, but they were, they were being mild in their criticism of apartheid and, and they were... Uh, comparing the violence of the, the army and the system and the police, they were comparing that to children throwing stones. Uh, we, we, we could not make sense of, of, of that. And so there would be various um, parts of that document that talks about reconciliation um, and, and peace and so on, uh, and the kind of false peace, I think, that some, sometimes happens. And so the document said we need a prophetic theology. And, of course, prophecy... Uh, is about um, afflicting the comfortable and comforting the afflicted. Uh, it's, it's both things at the same time. And um, it, was, it was a sign of hope for people. So people needed a sign of hope in the, in the mid-80s because the depression was so bad. Many of us were in prison, uh, people were being killed, people were in exile and so on. And there was a real um, sense that, you know, God, why are you not listening to us? And so we went to God with this, with this document uh, called the Kairos document. It was a real cry from the heart of the South African people. And uh, that document shook not only the South African churches, but the world church. Absolutely. It was incredible to see the reaction from across the globe, you know, uh, because... Uh, it shook uh, the foundations of theology, and it, it actually made theology public. You know, there was a, a special thing with some people said, when the church made news, you know, when the gospel made news, um, it, it, that's what it actually did. And so there was a public conversation uh, about it. And what then happened after that was that Several different countries across the globe. There was a Kairos Zimbabwe. There was a Kairos Swaziland. There was a Kairos Kenya. There was a Kairos India. The problem with all of those was that they, they, they wanted a document. Um, they, they didn't really want to take the process too seriously. We took the process very seriously. We, we made sure that we consulted and consulted and reconsulted and reconsulted until the document emerged that we, that we felt we could, we could present to the world. And um, so all these documents appeared, and there was a kind of a lull after that in terms of theological thinking. And of course, in 1990, five years after the Kairos document appeared, we got our, our freedom, in a sense, uh, because Mandela was released, the ANC was unbanned, and so on and so forth. And so there was a bit of a lull theologically. Until... 2009, when something very special happened. The, the Christians in Palestine said to us, we have been inspired by your Kairos document. And we want to do something similar. We also want to follow the process. And we told them what the process was. And so they started consulting with each other and talking to each other. But of course, they are suffering every day, and so, so they simply reflected on the suffering um, that, and, and it's not only the, 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 the physical suffering, but also the suffering that's inflicted on them theologically um, mm. by people who read the Bible in a particular way, uh, globally, actually. And uh, they then came out with the most incredible document called the Palestine Kairos document, A Word of Faith, Hope, and Love. And for us, reading that, um, our, the main author of our document, Father Albert Nolan, actually said to me, he said, he said, the Palestine Kairos document is even better than the South African Kairos document. You know, it's an even bigger gift to the world church 
um, than, than the South African Kairos document was. And for Albert to say that, and I'm talking about a Dominican theologian who is really at the heart of, of the writing of the South African Kairos document, that is a, a huge compliment to the Palestinian Christians. And we all know that, that at the end of the day, they were saying, it is about love. It is about love for our neighbors, love for our Jewish brothers and sisters, love for our Muslim sisters and brothers. Um, it's love for our country. And love is, is, is only seen in resistance to evil. Um, and then, then they spoke about how it is important to resist uh, the, the, the occupation um, of, of Palestine at the moment. And then how important it is for Christians across the globe to support them and to also reflect with them. And that's what we continue to do. And you were present uh, in 2009. And uh, uh, so how, t talk a little bit about how you continue to consult with Rifat Cassis, uh, our mutual friend, and yeah. others. Yeah. Well, in, in 2000, early 2009, they, they spoke to us. And we actually visited them in August of 2009 and um, helped them to think through the various questions. But we were very clear. We said to them, this is your document. Uh, this is your process. We are, not, we are only here to tell you about our experience, but uh, we are going to go home now and you will have to grapple with these questions and then you have to present this, this document to the world. And then December 2009, uh, we went all the way back to Bethlehem again for the launch of Palestine Kairos document. I saw uh, Bishop Tutu a few days before our departure and, and the arch gave me a letter that I could take to the, to the launch of Kairos Palestine, and that letter was read out um, um, at the launch, and the Palestinians were so happy. They were so happy that the arts sent this letter to, to support and to congratulate them um, on, on, on their document. And so what has happened since then is we have continued our relationship with, with, with them. We said to them, by the way, you say uh, we inspired you. You have now re-inspired us. Um, and so there's this mutual uh, inspiration that has happened uh, between South Africa and Palestine in particular. And we, you know, in South Africa, we, we take this, this matter extremely seriously. Man Nelson Mandela said to us, um, by South Africans, you are not free until Palestine is free. We take this very seriously. Uh, that was his intuition, and that's what we, what we work with. Um, and Archbishop Tutu, of course, urged us to continue supporting the Palestinian people. And so we are now involved with them to ensure that, that this message is taken up by the whole world church, in the World Council of Churches, in the World Communion of Reformed Churches, and everywhere else, so that that, that message can begin to filter into the pews, uh, and also partly because there's this poison of Christian Zionism uh, that is there. And many of our people eat and drink this poison all the time. And so we have to find a way to, um, to counter that. Um, and so it's a kind of a, an anti-poison an anti, uh, poison uh, document that, that, that Kairos has given to us. And of course, uh, <clears throat> Archbishop Tutu was the global patron for the Sabil uh, Liberation Theology Center in Jerusalem. Yes, yes, yes. He, he has always been very supportive of, uh, of Sabil, of course, of Father Naim Atik, uh, uh, who was the founder of Sabil, um, because he believed that it is important that Christians support those who are suffering. I mean, if your brother or your sister is suffering, it's the most natural thing to do. As South Africans, of course, we... We know what it is. I mean, we know what it is for people to support us. You know, I mean, when we were struggling, the whole world church, and I'm not talking so much about the top levels in terms of the bishops and so on. I'm talking about people in the pews. They were supporting us from across the globe. They were marching in the streets. They were standing in front of the embassy in London 24-7 in the cold, in the rain. They were standing there. They were boycotting. They were, there, was, there were boycotts, there were sanctions, there were divestment. These things were all happening. Um, and, and we knew about it. I, I met uh, people in Germany 
uh, and when they spoke about what happened, um, you know, as, as lay people, I thought, I sat there, th I thought to myself, is it really possible that someone can love another country more than they love their own country? I mean, this is, this is the, the, the feeling I got from these German activists, you know, and, and, and it's repeated in Sweden, it's repeated in, in different parts of the world, and we need to do that precisely now for Palestine. Uh, if we are going to see a change in Palestine, we have to get the level of activism and the level of energy up to that level now, so that our Palestinian sisters and brothers can know that they have our full support. Archbishop Tutu was, was both part of the church's institutional life, I mean, he was an archbishop, but he was also a prophetic figure. <clears throat> you know, that, that's it's a rare combination. I mean, uh, I'm thinking of just a handful of others. Uh, Archbishop Romero, Romero, for example, Naima Teek, when he was canon of St. George's Anglican Cathedral, and then uh, working with Sabeel uh, in East Jerusalem, uh, Martin Luther King Jr., uh, when he was a pastor at Ebenezer Baptist, but also part of uh, the Civil Rights Movement. How was the Arch, how was Archbishop Tutu able to balance both his priestly and prophetic roles? As I said at the beginning, the arch, you know, he was, he was one. He often said to us, liberation is indivisible, freedom is indivisible, uh, everything is, is one. And so for him, it was important that the institutional church comes to the party. Um, he, he made himself available to be a bishop of Lesotho. So that when he became the general secretary of, of the South African Council of Churches, he wasn't merely a reverend Tutu, he was Bishop Tutu. So he brought the, the whole graces and the gifts of the bishopric, he brought that to the, uh, to the position of general secretary, walking around with his purple cassock uh, in the streets of Soweto. Um, and, and he was able to do that um, because he believed that uh, that the activists have a certain amount of power. And so young people, for example, would say, if there's one person who supported us, it was Archbishop Tutu. You know, he was the one who, when we struggled, when we marched, he was there with us. Uh, and many, many young people, um, particularly those in the Black Consciousness Movement, they spoke about this. And then later on, he would be actively involved in, um, in the movement, uh, in the, the mass democratic movement. But you know, what was unique about him was that, that he was also to some extent independent of all of this. Uh, there's, a, there's a story of when he called for a march in Cape Town in 1989, 1989 just before uh, Mandela was released, he called for a mass march and some of the activists, the political activists, went to him and said, where did you get the mandate from to call for this march? And the arch looked at them and said, I have a mandate from God. I don't need any other mandate. I have a mandate from God. And, and they were shocked by this. And then he was very determined. He said, the march will go ahead. And the march went ahead. And there were, you know, 30,000 and more people on the streets for this particular march in 1989. So if there's something that's really, really unique about the arch, it is this ability to bring the, the institution and the street together in one. Uh, he was able to do that and able to do that very effectively. In fact, when he retired as archbishop, it was even more effective because then he didn't have the constraints of the office, as it were, <laughs> you know. And he could, for example, meet with the Dalai Lama. He could, for example, have Holy Communion with the Dalai Lama. If he was Archbishop, he wouldn't probably have done that, necessarily. Uh, but, but when he was free uh, from the constraints of office, he, he then was able to do that, and he was able to give it as an example uh, to, to the world. A very joyful example, of course, because the two of them were like two naughty boys <laughs> uh, in, in this latest movie called Mission Joy. We see that. And I think that, that 
uh, even after his death, he remains a challenge to, to the church in that sense. I'm glad you mentioned uh, uh, the, uh, Archbishop Tutu's relationship with, with the Dalai Lama. Uh, what, because what, one of the most distinctive uh, characteristics of uh, Archbishop Tutu in the, in the public uh, imagination is his laughter. Uh, yes. a, a childlike laughter that comes from the very center of his being. So for this last question, uh, talk to us a little bit about the arch and joy. Hmm. Yes, the arch, he, he had this deep sense of joy within him. So it is a joy that, that is there despite the ugliness and despite the suffering and despite, despite the polarization between people and so on, um, it's, it's a joy that comes from very deep within him, that comes from a spirituality. In fact, he, he would, for example, um, lay down when he would go and sleep and he would lay down in a fetal position. And he would do this because he says, he feels that he's being held by God like a baby is held in the womb. Um, and so that's why he would, he would lay in, in that particular position. And so his joy comes from a very deep place. Um, he, he could see joy in everything, uh, in children. He particularly enjoyed um, children uh, as well. But, but he was always, always joyful. And... Um, and he would, he would use humor, of course, very, very well in, in, in his public activism. I mean, I was at meetings where he would, he would stand at the microphone and he would say, he would say, uh, security police, I know you are here. I know you're here. You're welcome. You know, he would say that. And then he would say, oh, we, we also love you, by the way. Uh, and, and we want the best for you, you know. And, and he was really, I mean, it, it, it came from a very deep place because he was concerned about the humanity of each and every individual, even if they were part of the oppressor group. Uh, he, was, he was concerned about their humanity. And so his, his joy was not only special to behold, uh, his joy was infectious. Uh, his joy was shared with so many people. And so when people left his company, they also, in a sense, left with a, with a piece of this joy. And, and they were able to go and share that with others. Edwin Harrison, thank you very much for being here. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here.